Thank you, Dorothea. And welcome everyone. Today, I will demonstrate that five texts concerning Shakespeare were encrypted by the Elizabethan mathematician, Dr. John Dee. Uh, if you'd like to review this information, the slides and text are available as a PDF. Just follow the QR code or the link that's in your handout. I'll start off by showing you Alexander Waugh's recent decryption of the front matter of Shakespeare's sonnets of 1609. Uh, references to Waugh's work are included in your handout. Next, I'm gonna present the poem to the reader on the title page of the first folio. Thirdly, I'll go over Waugh's decryption of the funerary monument in Stratford-on-Avon. And against this background, I'll explain my discoveries that John Dee encoded his name three times in each of these texts, that his signatures do not occur randomly, and that they do more than merely identify him as the cryptographer. I found that Dee used his signatures as encryption keys. They're strategically placed to help us both locate and verify the messages he concealed within the works. Once I made this discovery, I quickly found two other texts concerning Shakespeare that were encrypted with the same unique system. The epitaph on Shakespeare's gravestone at Stratford and Hugh Holland's poem in the first folio. These last two texts have not been decrypted yet, but the first three contain a total of five statements that the works of Shakespeare were written by Edward de Vere. Four of those five statements include a dual authorship, De Vere and the grace of God within him. Now finding codes in Shakespeare has had a well-deserved bad reputation for some time, but this has changed in recent years. In the Journal of Scientific Exploration in 2020, Stanford physicist Peter Sturrock examined some early partial cryptograms found in the sonnets and the Stratford Monument, and he concludes that the mathematical probability that those cryptograms occurred by chance is less than one part in one million billion. In other words, these are encrypted texts. This doesn't mean that any message we find in them is genuine, though. Fortunately, Alexander Waugh and I have identified these encryption keys and rules. In order to understand these encryption techniques, it's helpful to know something about the philosophical beliefs that form their framework. First, Dee subscribed to the Christian hermetic idea that nature is divine and makes up a hidden fourth part of the Holy Trinity. Secondly, hermetic thinkers like Dee practiced an ancient form of Jewish mysticism called Kabbalah. During a two-year period in the 1560s, Dee, who had the largest library in England, purchased a total of 22 books. 20 of them were about Kabbalah. Kabbalah is a way of manipulating letters and numbers to reveal hidden connections between words. The three main techniques of Kabbalah are mentioned in Dee's book, Monas Hieroglyphica. All three techniques are also used in the encryptions I discussed today. They are notericon or acrostics, gematria in which numbers are assigned to letters based on their position in the alphabet, A is one, B is two, and so on, and seruf or anagram where letters are rearranged to form a new word. D believed that in using these techniques, he was not just playing with numbers. He believed he was manipulating reality itself. In Dee's mathematical preface to Euclid, he instructs his followers to use Gematria to find the number of their own name and link it to the fourfold trinity. Dee believed in that doing so would forge a real link between that person and the divine. There is evidence that Edward de Vere followed this advice. This is important because the number of de Vere's name is used by Dee as an encryption key. It is known that Dee and De Vere interacted. When Dee was accused of witchcraft in 1592, part of his defense included favorable letters from De Vere. Both were also involved in Frobisher's attempts to find the Northwest Passage. Now, before I explain the number of De Vere's name, I need to show you the central symbol used by Dee in each of these encryptions. It's called the Triple Tau. On the left is a triple tau on a modern day Freemasonic lapel pin. It looks like a capital T on a capital H. The symbol is made up of three T's joined at their bases representing the Holy Trinity. 
Together, the three T's of the triple tau form a fourth upside down T, symbolizing the hidden fourth element of the Trinity, God's creation. The letter T is important because it stands for both the Trinity and Jesus, since it's shaped like Jesus's cross. Freemasons call the triple tau the clavis ad thesaurum, or key to the treasure. John D. uses it as a key for unlocking all five of the encryptions I discussed. Now I'll explain the number of De Vere's name, which is 1740. 17 refers to De Vere's succession number as the 17th Earl of Oxford, and 40 is the number that De Vere used to link his name to the Holy Trinity. So the number 40 represents the Trinity because of its homophone, 4T. The word 40 sounds like 4T. Four T's stand for the three T's of the Holy Trinity plus the hidden fourth T of God's creation. Now, this might sound a little far-fetched, but the sounds made by letters and numbers were used in the practice of Kabbalah, and I have several references in your handout to that effect. 40 stands for De Vere because it is the numerical equivalent of his moniker, Double V. De Vere sometimes signed his name Double V because it alludes to his family motto, Vero Nihil Varius, or nothing truer than truth. When Gematria is used to convert Double V into a number, it equals 40. This is because V is the 20th letter in Latin alphabet, V equals 20, and two Vs, or Double V, equals 40. Other numbers and symbols used by D in these encryptions are the Cairo Christogram, the IHS Christogram, the Masonic G for God and the Iota Chi Christogram. Now the Iota Chi is represented by the numbers nine and 11 because of their Roman numeral forms, IX and XI. D uses these numbers and symbols as building blocks to create his ciphers. My findings deal mainly with a variation of the Cardano grill cipher, which I call a pictographic Cardano grill. It occurs in all five of the texts I discuss. The original Cardano grill was developed by the Italian polymath Girolamo Cardano. We know that Dee met Cardano at least once in London. On the left is Dee's annotated copy of a compendium of Cardano's works. In Cardano's grill, a message is written on paper that is covered by a sheet of metal with a pattern of holes cut out of it. The message is written on the exposed paper and then the grill is removed and the rest of the page is then filled in with writing to conceal the message. In order to read the message, the recipient must have a grill with identical cutouts. When the grill is laid over the text, only those words and letters that are part of the message will be visible. Now, this method, I argue, would not have served Dee's purposes because he wasn't sending this information to a known correspondent who had the same grill. He was trying to preserve it for posterity. So the solution couldn't rely on a physical grill that had to be passed down through the centuries. The key had to be contained within the encryption itself. Alexander Waugh discovered how Dee's grill ciphers use the shapes of hermetic symbols in place of a physical grill. This grid is from Dee's De Heptarchia Mystica. It's not believed to contain encryptions. I include it only to illustrate Dee's preoccupation with putting letters into grids and into shapes within the grid. Dee filled entire notebooks with grids like this. Here's how Dee's pictographic Cardano grill works. D composes the text in a grid of a certain number of columns across, adjusting spelling to fit his messages into certain shapes. Then the text is typeset or engraved with normal line breaks. To solve it, the first thing we have to do is figure out how many columns across the grid is supposed to be. Next, since we don't have a cutout grill to lay over the text, we have to follow clues to locate the shapes that contain D's messages. It's like a word search puzzle, except the words aren't just diagonal and across and vertical, they are fit into shapes like crosses. I have found a way to locate and verify D's shapes. It's an encryption rule that D tells us to look for 3D signatures. I'll show you how I found the 3D's encryption rule the first time, encoded in the pictographic Cardano grill in the sonnets. The text reads, to the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, Mr. W.H., all happiness and that eternity promised by our ever-living poet, wisheth the well-wishing adventurer in setting forth. So the bizarre syntax is the first indication that this text is encrypted. The second is the dots and hyphens between the words, which tell us that a particular variation of acrostic is being used. 
Most significantly, the triangle of three Ts represents the triple tau. Each of the five texts has a triple tau prominently placed like this one to signal that it's encrypted. So the first thing remember that we have to do is find the right number of columns for the grid. In this case, Waugh found it by using gematria. He counted and found 19 Ts in the text. The gematric value of T is 19 because it's the 19th letter of the Latin alphabet. T is the only letter in the dedication that occurs the same number of times as its gematric value. So we put the text into a 19 column grid. When this is done, the triple tau appears again to confirm that we found the correct grid. Note the lineup of three Ts in column 12 with the fourth T in column 13. These four Ts represent the triple tau with its hidden fourth T. The triple tau appears this way in all of these grill ciphers, and it often occurs in column 12. Here are the messages Wa found in the sonnets grid. The first is an anagram of the words of the Westminster inside the shape of Westminster Abbey's floor plan. In other words, the letters inside the Abbey floor plan can be rearranged to spell the Westminster. The message therefore begins to the Westminster, and you'll have to see Waugh's videos to get everything that, that led him to these shapes. I can't go over that all today. The next shape is a St. Peter's cross, so-called because St. Peter was crucified upside down. The cross contains the word South Isle. I-L-E is how Isle was spelled at the time, and the T-H in South is spelled with a Y or a thorn. The letters U and V were interchangeable in printing at the time. St. Peter's is the original name of the church at Westminster, so the first two shapes state to the Westminster at St. Peter's South Cross Isle. The third shape contains the words lies here, spelled out in order from top to bottom with Edward de Vere's initials at the base of the I. The shape is a capital I for the Latin name Iesus, and it reads Edward de Vere lies here. The three shapes together state, to the Westminster at St. Peter's South Cross Isle, Edward de Vere lies here. But how do we know these are genuine message shapes? As Waugh discovered, each shape is verified in three different ways. I'll only show you one of them today to see the QR code for more. Each shape is marked with the three letters that make up the IHS Christogram. Notice that beneath the floor plan of Westminster, the letters occur twice, once in reverse order, which confirms the reversal of the floor plan. This explains the odd phrase, wisheth the well-wishing. It's what gives D his three IHS Christograms. Now, I'd like to move on to my discovery that this grid contains three D signatures and an encryption rule telling us to look for them. Here are the first two D signatures found by Alexander Waugh. The D in the cloister of Westminster Abbey is actually the start of a diagonal D, Dr. D signature. The third D signature was easy to find because there are only three Ds in the whole text. It connects with two E's and a shape like a mason's square. I know this is a genuine signature because it's part of an encryption rule that instructs us to look for three Ds. Take a look at column three. This is the same grid we've been looking at. Waugh noticed that this column begins and ends with a TH, the letters of the triple tau, and that it has a T in the center. He also realized that the word three is spelled out in column three in order. I realize that the word three joins with the Mason square D signature to form a message, three Ds. I claim this message was put here to instruct us to look for three D signatures and pay attention to what they reveal. My claim is supported by the fact that I found similar three Ds devices in the Stratford monument, the gravestone epitaph and to the reader, all of which also contain three D signatures. Now I'm gonna move on to the pictographic Cardano grill into the reader. This grill cipher was found by Sean O'Donovan and myself using Waugh's methods of cryptanalysis. This shows that these methods are reproducible. O'Donovan just watched some of Waugh's videos and went and looked at the first folio and found this grid. Note the four O's in the lower right corner of the text. They stand for the number 40 and the four T's of the triple tau. As such, the four O's indicate that this text is encrypted like the four T's do in the sonnet's preface. This also sheds light on why in the first folio, the stage direction Hamlet dies reads O-O-O-O dies. These four O's represent the number 40, which De Vere used to link his name to the four T's of the fourfold trinity. To find the right number of columns, remember, we need to use the same technique while used in decrypting the sonnets. There are 13 N's. N is the 13th letter of the Latin alphabet, and it's the only letter to occur the same number of times as its geometric value. 
Once again, the triple tau appears at the top of column 12 with a fourth T in column 13 to confirm that we found the correct number of columns for the grid. Note, remember, these are the same column numbers where the triple tau occurs in the sonnets grid. Another notable feature of To the Reader's Grid is these three sets of diagonal triple E's. Each one intersects a diagonal D signature. Each signature occurs in column nine, which is the number of the iota chi Christogram. D draws attention to these signatures by including a three D's encryption rule. If we follow the diagonal line of the third D signature, we find the word under. Opposite this is the word a côté, which means beside in French. D used this triangle spelling under and a côté to state that we should look under and beside his signatures for messages. When O'Donovan followed this instruction, he found that the top D signatures point to a square of nine letters with the name Ver spelled out in three overlapping triangles. Here's the first, the second, and the third. The ninth unused letter in the square is G for God. Just below the square are the words was Shakespeare. This is only one of four instances that I mentioned in which God and Veer are said to have written the works of Shakespeare. Now, it could be a coincidence that, these, that the square is on top of these two words, but D does not leave this sort of thing to chance. I have discovered how to authenticate this message. It has to do with the T's and TH's, the letters of the triple tau that you see highlighted here. The technique I discovered is used by D in the other encryptions I'll discuss as well. I'll explain it to you soon. First, I wanna show you the shape that I found into the reader. It's a large cross spanning the entire height of its grid. The D signatures indicate its defining feature, these two sets of double A's. See your handout for references to the significance of the double A for Shakespeare. The horizontal beam of the cross is marked by double O's on the left and right. These four O's give us 40 or the four T of the triple tau. The horizontal beam is also marked by T's at each end. At the intersection of the beam is the 17th T in the poem. The 17th T and the four O's give us an instance of De Vere's number 1740 to verify the cross. At the bottom of the cross is the word B, which is significant for Rosicrucians and Freemasons, as you see in this engraving of the Rose Cross from 1629. At the base of the cross are two sets of the initials of Christ. Recall the letters of the IHS Christogram were also used to demarcate messages in the sonnets. The nine letter square spelling G and Ver is balanced on top of the cross. The letters that form the cross are an anagram of the word vide shadows. To the Elizabethans, the word shadow was used to refer to a portrait, an actor, a falsehood, or a deception. I suggest this anagram refers to the Droshout engraving, which is on the facing page. Now I need to move on to the Stratford Monuments, 3D signatures and 3D's encryption rule. The four T's in the lower right corner signify that the engraving is encrypted. Waugh found the correct number of columns for the grid encoded in the second line of Latin in the top, which has 34 characters. Here is the text typed into its 34 column grid. I quickly located its 3D signatures, which are all in the shape of Mason squares, and two of them are Dr. D signatures. Note how D modified the spelling of the text so he could fit his signatures into the grid right where he wanted them. He uses the Middle English spelling of died, D-I-D-E, and the word then instead of than to form the middle D signature. The use of the German imperative form of C, S-I-E-H, has puzzled scholars for centuries. I will explain why D uses this spelling shortly. First, note that the two signatures on the left are sitting on an anagram of the word three, indicating once again that we are to look for three D signatures. This is the third occurrence of the three D's encryption rule. Now, before moving on, I need to show you Waugh's decryption of the Stratford Monument. Waugh found this message in the shape of a key, an important symbol in Freemasonry. The words inside the key are spelled out perfectly in order, except for lives, which has two letters out of place. So here's what the message says. See, thou. Now, see thou was a common phrase at the time, meaning see to it. So see to it, there lives in Shakespeare, whose name he is. So now we know why the word C was spelled S-I-E-H on the monument. It's not a mistake. 
It's how D fit the words he is into the key shape. But there's more. Note that the critical proportions of the key are marked out by four Ts, two centered on top of the bow and one on each ward. These four Ts of the triple tau validate the key shape. I couldn't help thinking though that it would have been even more useful if we could have used these Ts to locate the key shape in the first place. It was in pondering this that I discovered how the Ds and Ts function as encryption keys. At first, it seemed impossible to use the Ts as clues because they're Ts all over the grid. Then I looked again at the placement of the D signatures. I realized that if we look only at the T's near the signatures, specifically those that either touch or lie between the D signatures, then we can narrow our focus. These T's highlighted in pink are all of the T's that either touch or lie between the D signatures. And here you see how every one of them helps to delineate the key. Note that they mark precisely those parts of the key that are not already indicated by the four gold T's that Wah found inside the key shape. Here's a closer view. The T's remind me of the tabs that hold an outfit on a paper doll. At this point, I concluded that the T's and D signatures were deliberately positioned to help someone locate and verify this message shape. As soon as I recognized this encryption rule, I quickly found that it works for to the reader and the sonnets as well. I went back to the sonnets grid and highlighted all the T's that either touch or lie between the D signatures. Here you can see that all of these T's help to indicate the sonnets message shapes. Also recall how the D signatures and T's help to define the cross into the reader. When I examined the message into the reader that says God and Vera was Shakespeare, I found that three THs and a fourth T neatly bookend the message. To summarize, I've discovered that in each of these texts, the D signatures and the T's near them were positioned to serve as keys to unlock and verify D's messages. My results are supported by the three D's encryption rule that I found encoded in each of these grids. The most striking example of the three D's encryption rule is in the pictographic Cardano grill in the Stratford gravestone. Here's a picture of the stone as it looks today. It reads, good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Here's the triple tau lined up in the center of the stone. This is not the original gravestone, though. The original was replaced in the 1800s with a copy. Fortunately, several drawings of the original stone have survived. Unfortunately, they don't all share the same details. Here's one drawing of the original stone that I suspect preserves the original spelling, capitalization, and punctuation. I believe these marks, these odd punctuation marks appear in other sketches of the original stone, but this is the only one that contains all three. And I believe these marks were present on the original gravestone because the number of letters from the beginning of the epitaph to the hyphen after dust is 40, and the number of letters from the comma after curse to the end is 17. Once again, 1740 is Edward de Vere's code number and is used by John Dee to validate messages in his encryptions. Next, I noticed that in this drawing, two sets of vertical T's are visible. I decided to type the text into a grid with the original line breaks as it's engraved, just to see if the T's really line up. They do, and the grid also reveals a D signature in column number nine, the number of the iota chi Christogram. The typed grid also helped me to understand why SAKE is spelled in all caps, and why there's a capital A in the middle of the word enclosed, which, by the way, I have not found a single other instance of enclosed being spelled with an A. This unusual spelling and capitaliz capitalization forms a double A in column 19, which is the geometric value of the all-important letter T. It was easy to find the correct number of columns for this grid. It's enclosed here between these two odd punctuation marks. There are 11 letters between the hyphen and the period. So I tried an 11 column grid. Recall that 11 is also the number of the iota chi Christogram. The 11 column grid reveals three D signatures centered on column six. This grid also contains a stunning example of the three D's encryption rule. It's an X also called a St. Andrew's cross spelling three D's. Only one letter per word is out of position. No letters are used twice or more than once. Uh, the cross is centered and is perfectly framed by the three D signatures. This is the fourth instance I found of the three D's encryption rule. 
The last encryption I'll discuss is the pictographic Cardano Grill in Hugh Holland's poem for the first folio. It's entitled Upon the Lines and Life of the famous scenic poet, Master William Shakespeare. The three T's in the upper left margin suggest it is encrypted. I decided to also type this poem into a grid with the line breaks as typeset since that confirmed the triple tiles in the gravestone epitaph. This grid reveals a diagonal row of four T's ending in columns 12 and 13. Recall that these are the same columns in which the triple tile appears in sonnets and to the reader. The correct number of columns for the grid was easy to find. Once again, I got it on the first try. It's an 11 column grid based on the 11 letters in Hugh Holland's name. Once again, 11 stands for the Iota Chi Christogram. When the poem is put into its 11 column grid, this time the triple tau appears twice to verify that we found the correct number of columns. The first is these four THs lined up in column three, the number of the Trinity. The second occurs in columns eight and nine. These four O's stand for 40, which represent the four T's of the triple tau. This is the only grid that has two triple tau's, and it's also the only one that does not contain the three D's encryption rule. I suspect it is because this grid doesn't have three D signatures, it has six. Each one intersects the letters of the IHS Christogram. Note that the third IHS continues downward to spell Deus, Latin for God. <clears throat> Deus is also how D often Latinized his own name. Until this encryption is solved, we can't conclude that its D signatures delineate hidden messages. However, the fact that the signatures are marked by the IHS Christogram suggests they are genuine and significant. This concludes my contribution to understanding how these five encryptions work. Before I go though, I want to show you the geometric cipher that Alexander Waugh found in the sonnet's title page. I include this because it combines with the sonnet's grill cipher to encode the precise spot in St. Peter's South Cross Isle where Edward de Vere lies. A man called Alan Green discovered that certain dots and lines on the title page can be joined to form four right angle triangles. Using Thales' theorem, these four right triangles form a perfect circle. When the P in Shakespeare's is extended downward, it runs directly through the center of the circle. Dots are then connected to form the X of the Cairo Christogram. Note that the Cairo also runs right through the period after the fourth T on the title page. And remember that De Vere is the fourth T. Notice how the Cairo is not centered on the page. Likewise, the columns of the South Cross Isle at Westminster are off center. Note also how the downward stroke of the Cairo falls just to the right of the N in sonnets. The line marks the same degree that the columns of the South Cross Isle at Westminster are aligned not due north, but slightly northeast. These facts inspired Waugh to superimpose this hidden geometry on the title page upon a floor plan of Westminster Abbey. He did it in such a way that the Cairo bisects the columns of the South Cross Isle and the circle is sized to bisect the columns at, to the north and south. So Waugh deduced that the dot after the fourth T would indicate De Vere's burial place. He was about to drive straight to Westminster Abbey to see if maybe there was a small cross like engraved on the floor. But then he saw where the dot after the fourth T lands. It lands directly on the monument to Shakespeare, which was erected by Freemasons in the year 1740, the number of De Vere's name. Notice the statue's stance, his arms and legs form a Cairo symbol, as is the case with many Freemasonic portraits. In conclusion, I have provided evidence that John Dee encrypted these five texts using a previously unknown system of early modern cryptography that I call a pictographic Cardano grill. I've shown where D encoded his name in each text and how his signatures serve as encryption keys. These findings are supported by the 3D's encryption rule that I found encoded in four of the texts. In the three texts that have been decrypted to date, Edward de Vere is named five times as the author of Shakespeare's works. Could D have imagined that his secret would lie hidden for 400 years? Given his philosophical beliefs, it might not have mattered to Dee if his encryptions were ever solved. 
Merely by constructing them, he believed he was manipulating letters and numbers in a way that affected reality itself. For four centuries, we've carried out the poet's wish in Sonnet 72 that my name be buried where my body is. All this time, these encryptions have served as invisible monuments to the author of the pseudonymous works of William Shakespeare. I'd like to remind you that none of my discoveries would have been possible without the work of Alexander Waugh. So many thanks to you, Alexander, and thanks also to all of you for listening. Uh, thank you. That was very interesting. And I'm certainly not, um, uh, I am on board with at least some of your premises, but I just uh, Googled John D and he died in 1609. So my question is, how does that, how does, how do these uh, dates relate to your argument? Because it seems to me that in order for this to be correct, that would mean that all these documents would have had been prepared many years in advance of the folio. Thank you. That's a great question. I don't obviously know the answer to that question, but I have two um, proposals. The first is it was known for decades before these publications that De Vere's identity would be kept a secret. I believe that Dee and De Vere uh, may have worked on these together. I believe that Ben Johnson was involved. Um, and I also suggest it's possible that some of their cohort may have used these encryption techniques and his name to create these at a later date. Um, so I believe this encryption technique was created by D. He's lucky his name is D-E-E. -E. Uh, you know, that's really easy to work with those letters. And to, I showed you how he manipulated them to get them in the right location. I could see how some of his colleagues might have thought, I wish my name were D and, you know, just use that uh, same technique. So I don't know the answer to your question, but I do believe it's perfectly plausible that this would have been put into place de even decades earlier. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? What was the first thing that sparked your interest? Uh, I um, found one of Alexander Waugh's lectures uh, on um, his cryptography work, and that was the beginning of the end for me. <laughs> I've been obsessed with it ever since. So I'm curious, do you, do you have any um, insight as to who the TT is that signed the bottom of the sonnets or whose name is or what is there? At the bottom. Well, it was believed to be Thomas Thorpe's initials. I believe it was, it could have been, I believe it was put there to help uh, create the triple tail. Thank you all so much.